When given the choice in a video game, we will usually choose to do the right thing, like sparing this little sister in Bioshock, even though if we were to eat her, we would get so much DNA altering Adam power. Ugh. <sighs> Thank you, mister. Yeah, you're just lucky I had a big lunch. What could be more frustrating then than trying desperately to do the right thing only for the game to absolutely refuse to let you, forcing you into doing the wrong thing no matter how hard you struggle against it, and boy did we struggle. You know, like a little sister. Full of delicious Adam. Please. No, don't shoot! Share our guilt and irritation then at these seven times we tried to do the right thing, but the game didn't let us. Beware spoilers for the following games. The vital apparatus and will deliver a weighted companion cube in three, two, one. It's no exaggeration to say that the relationship between the player of Portal and the game's weighted companion cube is a greater love story than Romeo and Juliet, and frankly is one million times more tragic. This weighted cube encountered in the game's 17th test chamber is unvoiced and entirely inanimate, yet will become your very best friend in a short span of time with a two-pronged emotional attack of one, being invaluable in helping you solve puzzles, and two, having little hearts on it. The enrichment center reminds you that the weighted companion cube cannot speak. In the event that the weighted companion cube does speak, the enrichment center urges you to disregard its advice. Which makes it all the more painful when GLaDOS, the robotic puppet master guiding you through these increasingly sadistic test chambers, insists the companion cube must be euthanized in an incinerator before you can proceed. You did it. The weighted companion cube certainly brought you good luck. However, it cannot accompany you for the rest of the test and, unfortunately, must be euthanized. Please escort your companion cube to the Aperture Science Emergency Intelligence Incinerator. Now, developer Valve probably imagined this sequence in which you must burn the companion cube to be a brief gag, a dark but funny punchline to Test Chamber 17, in keeping with the game's tone and giving GLaDOS a few more funny lines to be delivered with her trademark dispassion. While it has been a faithful companion, your companion cube cannot accompany you through the rest of the test. If it could talk, and the Enrichment Center takes this opportunity to remind you that it cannot, it would tell you to go on without it because it would rather die in a fire than become a burden to you. What developer Valve probably didn't imagine was this bit increasing Portal's total playtime by a good half hour at least, as players put progress on pause to scry every single polygon of Test Chamber 17, desperately seeking some hidden workaround or glitch that would let them progress without having to murder the beloved Companion Cube. Destroy your Companion Cube or the testing cannot continue. It's telling that this is one of the few points in the game where you're likely to start hearing GLaDOS's voice lines repeat, because no Portal player wants to melt down their best friend until they've made absolutely certain the game doesn't have some secret way of letting you not do that. Even once you realise there really is no sanctioned way to do the right thing and keep the companion cube safe, expect to find yourself trying all sorts of loopholes, like maybe we could die in its place? Testing cannot continue until your companion cube has been incinerated. Or perhaps the game's geometry will think the cube went in if we hold it just so. You euthanized your faithful companion cube more quickly than any test subject on record. Congratulations. Damn. Eat your heart out, Shakespeare. Take me to her. You don't have to worry about her anymore. We'll take care I of her. I worry. Just let me see her, please. You can't. She's being prepped for surgery. 
In The Last of Us, you play as Joel Miller, a man who has done plenty of ethically questionable things while surviving North America's zombie outbreak. One of the worst being him pushing Ellie in the water in The Last of Us Part 2. Oh my god, Joel, do you know how long it takes denim to dry out? Now she's got to walk about in wet jeans. Oh, you're the worst. Something that might just beat this is what he does in trying to save Ellie from certain death. See, Ellie is immune to the Cordyceps brain infection that has wiped out most of the population. And so, in the first game, Joel is tasked with getting her safely to the Fireflies, who hope to use Ellie's immunity to find some kind of cure or vaccine. However, once at their hospital base, Joel discovers that Ellie will have to die in order for the Fireflies to get what they want. The hell do you mean, surgery? The doctors tell me the cordyceps, the growth inside her, has somehow mutated. It's why she's immune. Once they remove it, they'll be able to reverse engineer a vaccine. A vaccine. But it grows all over the brain. It does. Hmm, yeah, her brain. She needs that, right? This isn't a decision the Fireflies are taking lightly, but Joel sees Ellie as the daughter he previously lost, and not wanting to lose yet another kid, he decides to ignore the bigger picture and break her out. This decision not only involves robbing the world of a life-saving vaccine, but also shooting and hacking his way through a bunch of people in a life-ending rampage. Oh, and some stealthier kills too. I mean, I guess if you count that as stealthy. But at least these guys could somewhat defend themselves with all their firepower. This is not the case for the surgeon in the operating theatre, who, when you burst into the room, rushes to arm himself with a single scalpel. I won't let you take her. This is our future. Think of all the lives we'll save. At this point, you'll probably want to take out your gun and fire a warning shot over this effectively unarmed man's shoulder to scare him away and... <laughs> ah. Damn. Yeah, sorry if you didn't want to kill one of the only living surgeons in the post-apocalypse, but there is no way around this guy except by shooting him dead. No matter how much you try to get around him or find an alternative solution, the game will not let you. <laughs> Wow, didn't even flinch. And if you wait too long, well... The only way past the surgeon is to shoot him, and as said before, you cannot do this non-lethally. Even if you shoot him in his little toe, it'll still kill him, as if the bullet has ricocheted off the floor and directly into his heart. Look, if you can't survive having your toe shot off, you've got no place in the post-apocalypse. Go forth, Galvin. May you be unharmed. You'd have to be pretty naive to play Demon's Souls expecting to have a good time. I mean, this is a game with a whole area called the Swamp of Sorrow, in the Valley of Defilement, where lives a boss who shoots bees at you out of a gun arm. That said, while you wouldn't expect this rock-hard sword and shield em up to be all sunshine and roses, you might not expect it to be desperately sad. And yet sadness is exactly what awaits anyone who ventures into the furthest recesses of the Valley of Defilement, because that's where you'll find a boss battle that's guaranteed to make you miserable and guilty, and there's absolutely no way around it no matter how hard you struggle. This is Maiden Astraea, a peaceful woman who, while technically the possessor of a demon soul, has come down here into the worst recesses of the Valley of Defilement to offer alms to the sick and needy. Something she explains in very reasonable terms as soon as you walk in, in a way that'll make you feel very bad for indulging your first instinct to start swinging your sword around. Leave us, Slayer of Demons. <laughs> this is a sanctuary for the lost. And wretched. Oops, sorry folks. I mean, you were all already pretty sick, at least. Please, leave quietly. 
In a radical departure from the game up until now, nothing is currently trying to kill you, and Astraya asks you so politely to be on your way in such pitiful tones that you may very well decide that actually it wouldn't be so bad to leave this lot alone. After all, they're not hurting anybody. If, however, after wrestling with your conscience and deciding to do the right thing and leave, you'll find the game has made that completely impossible, and that fog gate you strolled through so casually earlier is now totally impassable. So although it seems that you're being offered a choice to bypass this boss fight, in fact the game won't let you take the peaceful route at all, so you have no choice but to kill Astraya's faithful bodyguard, Garl Vinland, while apologising profusely. Sorry. Sorry, 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 sorry. Having been denied the chance to spare her to defeat Maiden Astraya, you need only walk up and talk to her, at which point she'll end her own existence, making this perhaps the easiest boss fight in the game to win, but the hardest to live with. You. You killed him, didn't you? Very well. I can no longer resist you. Do as you like. Take your precious demon soul. Sorry. What's the ruckus, boss? Get back! We got a cursed creature in here! Oh, yeah? It's as big as a mule and as mean as a hellcat. <laughs> it looks like a lion to me. That's a dog in there. A, a dog? No. you excuse me. Red Dead Redemption's Wild West is full of quirky characters, none quite so eccentric as circus performer Margaret. What the devil are you looking at? You find him with a bunch of empty cages and he asks you to find a bunch of missing animals to fill them with, namely some exotic beasts which have escaped from his <clears throat> care. What escaped? A priceless Ranjaniki tiger from the slopes of the Hindu heights. A fantastic, elusive zebra from the plains of Ongo Bongo by the shores of the Limpopo. And a magnificent lion from the grasslands of Tanganyika. So off you trot, literally, to round them all up. And when you find Margaret's zebra, it turns out to actually be a donkey with stripes painted on it. What they done to you? I think they've painted it to look like a zebra, Arthur. Plus when you find the tiger, you find out that it's actually just a cougar with stripes painted on it. And it ate one of Margaret's lions, a dog in disguise. Strappy ate King, Mr. Margaret. I saw her do it. I always thought they got along. Oh, she liked him just fine. She licked her chops and asked for seconds. When he asks you to find his final lion, Margaret makes a real plea for you to bring it back to him unharmed, which shouldn't be too hard, bearing in mind it'll probably be a raccoon in a wig. We're lately very short on lions, so I'd be very grateful. All kinds of grateful. But when you find it, you discover that, alarmingly, this big cat is not another fake, but a real bona fide lion. Sweet. Well, Arthur, I was thinking more along the lines of, oh piss, it's a sh lion. Still, Margaret needs his lion, so we better not shoot it in case we kill it, and then Margaret doesn't have a show anymore, and... Oh, okay, then maybe just one shot in the paw to neutralize it? Poor thing's probably just scared. Ah, right then. Um, maybe some shots around it to show you're serious? Yeah, no, sorry Margaret, but unlike the other animals we wrangled for you, I don't think we can get the lion back to you in one piece without it insta-killing Arthur here. Sadly, the only way to survive this encounter is by filling this lion's face with bullets, no matter how little you want to kill an endangered animal who has been trapped in captivity. I'm sorry, buddy. Still, we will treat your corpse with the respect it deserves by hacking off part of it for a trophy. Again, I'm sorry. We just wanted to take a quiet pause out of respect. <clears throat> Come on, follow me. Uh, the little one can wait for us in the living room. No, she always stays with me. Of course. Right this way? Everything we need is in the basement. 
Detroit Become Human is a game that gives the player a lot of power, like the power to determine the outcome of an android revolution, or getting to hear what it would sound like if Mr. Krabs from SpongeBob got too drunk to stand up by himself. I think I'm gonna be sick. Take a bow, voice actor Clancy Brown. Detroit even gives you the power to do the opposite of what you're told, like for instance if you don't want to be chasing down friendly android Kara in this scene, you can just stand still and the game will let her get away easily. Oh, f that's insane. Language, Mr. Krabs. The game isn't always so graceful in letting you do what is clearly the right thing, however, and a prime example comes when the aforementioned Kara finds herself in the living room of suspicious weirdos Lutko Andronikov, who wants her to come down to his basement so he can remove her tracking chip. But first, we have to get rid of your tracker. Tracker? Yeah. All androids are fitted with a tracking device to locate them at all times. See, at this point in the game, you, the player, know full well the trackers in Deviant Androids don't work, or else all those chapters you played as a cop trying to track down Deviant Androids would have been frankly a lot easier. Knowing this, the right thing to do is clearly to steer Kara and Alice, the kid she's protecting, as far AF as possible from Zlatko ASAP. Come through meaningful choices. Except, oh no, at this point, the game positively will not let you do the right thing, no matter how hard you try. Making the door you came in completely unopenable, and stopping you if you try and find another path that doesn't lead to what is so clearly going to be a murder basement. So, actually, there's no reason to remove your tracker. What? But you said that- Yeah, uh, people believe what they want. You deviants! are so naive. Oh look, it was a murder basement. Why does the game force you down here? Well, probably because it's too pleased with the upcoming sneak through the house to escape set piece to let you skip that. Go fetch the little one. Right away, Zarko. Instead, Detroit Become Human prefers to send you on a funhouse tour round Zlatko's creepy residence, the owner now revealed to be obsessed with making twisted android modifications. He must always obey the master. Oh yes. On this grim tour, expect to meet his horrifying experiments, and an android polar bear in an unlockable cage. All the time sulking that if the game had offered you the choice to do what you knew was the right thing from the start, all this escaping nonsense could have been avoided. Worst of all, the bear doesn't even get to wreak a terrible vengeance on its cruel creator. Heads up, video game developers, if I unleash an android polar bear, I expect it to kill every character, and for that to be the good ending. This man Makarov is fighting his own war and he has no rules, no boundaries, he doesn't flinch at torture, human trafficking or genocide. He's not loyal to a flag or a country or any set of ideals. He trades blood for money. He's your new best friend. You may very well recall the most notorious mission in bleak 2009 shoot-'em-up Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2. The mission controversial enough to warrant a content notice when you start the game that offers to skip the mission unless you confirm you will not be offended by it. A warning that frankly would be more useful if it told you anything about the mission in question, but hey. Called No Russian, the mission has the player take part in a terrorist attack on an airport. And in the spirit of trying to do better than Call of Duty in terms of content warnings, you're going to see a bit of that attack in this entry, so heads up. Remember, No Russian. In No Russian, you play the role of an undercover CIA operative, collaborating in the airport atrocity to get close to ringleader Makarov, a sacrifice that proves to be utterly pointless at the end of the mission when it turns out Makarov knew you were CIA all along. You sent a strong message with this attack, Makarov. That was no message. <laughs> this is a message. The Americans thought he could deceive us. When they find out why, all of Russia will cry for war. Armed with this knowledge, and more importantly with a machine gun, the sensible course of action here is to clearly replay the mission, this time trying to do the right thing, i.e. finding a defensive position, then killing Makarov and his cronies as soon as you're able to pull the trigger, thus saving dozens of lives, including your own. But oh dear, the game won't let you do it, as Makarov quickly turns on you before a stern game over tells you you blew your cover, which is especially annoying if by this point you know your cover is actually already blown. Moreover,
However, with enough attempts, you'll realize the game has made Makarov himself invincible, able to withstand infinite bullets, which, I mean, at least is good intel to be able to bring back to the folks at Langley. Fire. Though you can't kill Makarov, perhaps you're thinking you could stay in the lift at the start, refusing to take part and robbing Makarov of the American corpse he needs at the end of the mission to spark an international crisis. I have no patience for cowards. But no dice. After a few minutes of this tactic, Makarov and pals will backtrack through the level just to kill you for a subtly different game over. As such, stopping Makarov right here is impossible no matter how hard you struggle, and the closest we could manage was going into the game's config file to turn off clipping so you can fly through walls. This also makes you invincible, so at least you can keep the unkillable Makarov distracted shooting at the ceiling like you're a lost pigeon that's just pooped on his best tactical vest. We're no experts in military ethics, but we've seen Gladiator enough times to know that when an enemy is defeated and offering surrender, the right thing to do is spare them. That's how you get a nickname like Maximus the Merciful and not Maximus the Worstiful. But one game that plays fast and loose with the accepted rules of engagement is 1995's Rise of the Triad. For instance, we don't remember a bit in the Geneva Convention where it says it's okay to smite your enemies with a god hand while making weird moaning noises. Nowhere is Rise of the Triad's wobbly moral compass more obvious than when an enemy surrenders, throwing down their guns and begging you not to shoot. Which sometimes happens if you manage to damage them, but not quite enough to kill them outright. Please. No, don't shoot. When this occurs, you'll probably want to do the right thing and spare that enemy, but hey, guess what? Rise of the Triad has other plans. No, don't shoot! No! No! Please! No! Don't shoot! No. Wait just a moment and surrendering enemies will collapse, seemingly dead, perhaps of their wounds, leaving you slightly bewildered but at least not having shot an unarmed enemy in cold blood. Your foe will remain on the ground indefinitely, until, that is, you turn your back for even a moment and then oh guess who's feeling all better. Yeah, the surrenders are total fake-outs, which means not only can you not accept a capitulation in Rise of the Triad and move on with your head held high, but that you're kind of pressured to actually murder those enemies who do surrender, unless you want a bullet in the spine the very second you look away. At least with the hand of God this isn't a problem. Really coming around on the God hand thing. So those were seven times we tried to do the right thing, but the game wouldn't let us, damn it, which was most frustrating for you. And can you think of any other examples? Let us know in the comments down below. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to click the like button. And uh, if you really enjoyed it and you haven't already, why not subscribe? Because we've got way more videos like this, fun gameplay videos, and also some cool tabletop series on here and over on Outside Xbox. Uh, we have a lot of fun on this channel and we would like you to join us. Thanks for watching. Bye.